So welcome everybody to the uh, analysis seminar at the uh, Institute. Um, uh, this is actually the second one uh, of um, 2021. And our speaker today is uh, uh, Gregory Bercolaiko. It's actually the third one, I think. Yeah, uh, the third. And our speaker is Gregory Bercolaiko and he will, um, so from Texas A&M uh, University, and he will talk about uh, index theorems for nodal count and the lateral variational principle. Please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I, I put uh, in, in the chat, I put a link to the PDF of, of the presentation just in case uh, you want to check something uh, something back or or you just get bored and don't want to listen to to me and want to steam ahead and f find out all the answers uh, it's all there um so i'll i'll start with the protracted introduction um listing three results uh that kind of motivate our construction uh the the main construction is uh uh, due to Peter Kuchman and myself, although it was inspired by joint work with Shaizek and Zani, Graham Cox, and uh, Jeremy Marzua. Um, but the, I will first go through some older results by ourselves and not ourselves, actually. Um, so let me set up the notation. Um, so Fn will denote nth eigenfunction of Laplacian, uh, which will be on different settings, uh, it, it, uh, discrete graphs or domains. If it's a domain, then we understand Dirichlet Laplacian normally. Um, phi n will denote the number of zeros of nth eigenfunction when it is reasonable to, uh, to have such a quantity. Um, and uh, for example, on an interval, uh, the number of zeros is n minus one for nth eigenfunction. Uh, that's an old result by Sturm. Uh, new n will denote the number of nodal domains. Uh, so if you have a, a, a domain like this, uh, where you consider Dirichlet Laplace, and you look at the zero set of the eigenfunction, this is uh, drawn sort of in blue here, and then you count the number of connected components when, once you subtract the zero set. So this is the number of nodal domains because on uh, when, when zero, um, zero curves are, are continuous, it doesn't make sense to talk about zeros of eigenfunctions. They're not discrete things. Um, and the old theorem by current, I'm sure uh, you have heard about it, uh, says that the nth, eigenfunction um, on a domain has at most n nodal domains. Uh, zero set of the eigenfunction will be den denoted by z of fn. So it's just num uh, all points where the eigenfunction turns to zero. OK, so um, here is an sort of old result number one. Um, there, is a, there is a whole um, sub area talking about spectral minimal partitions. Um, so here is the setup. Uh, what is drawn here is actually not necessarily a nodal set of an eigenfunction. I, I just used the same drawing for two purposes. So here we start with the domain. Uh, we have in the background uh, an operator like Dirichlet Laplace, but, but we forget about it for a moment. So what we do is we uh, draw some boundaries we kind of try to guess the nodal set or, or even just draw some, some arbitrary lines, uh, which partition the domain into some subdomains, in this case, three, three parts. And then we associate to this partition an energy uh, as follows. We take each part separately. We solve Dirichlet eigenvalue problem on this part. We take the smallest eigenvalue, and then we, we take the maximum of the smallest eigenvalues over the all, uh, over all subdomains. And I'll denote the number of the subdomains by, by k here. 
uh, and it's a reasonable question to ask uh, what are the properties of the minimum of this, this energy? Which partitions minimize, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a beautiful theorem uh, by Helfer, Hoffman, Ostenhoff, and Terracini uh, that says that the following. So suppose you found the minimizing partition. Um, and suppose it is bipartite. Then you know that this partition corresponds to an eigenfunction. Uh, bipartite, by the way, means that you can assign signs to it uh, in a uh, reasonable fashion. So like two pluses don't, don't share a boundary and two minuses don't share a boundary. So an example of a partition which is not bipartite, uh, but which does arise as a minimal partition is partition like uh, Mercedes sign. So this, this will not be bipartite. Um, so in fact, it's an if and only if, um, theorem if you throw in the following conditions. So the only nodal partitions uh, that will be uh, minimizing are uh, partitions of the eigenfunctions which hit this current bound exactly. So, so if the if you have an nth eigenfunction which has n partitions, uh, sorry, nth nodal domains, then its nodal partition is optimal in the sense of this functional. Um, and of course, there is there are two reasonable questions. What about other partitions? Um, well, I, I drew an example which uh, sort of disappeared. Other partitions will, will have this sort of form. It will have this triple points, so they will not be bipartite. So this is, this is a reasonable partition which could happen to be minimal. Um, and what about other eigenfunctions which, uh, which don't, have, don't satisfy this bound? By the way, uh, there is a result by Pliel which uh, proved uh, the, the result, which implies that there is only finitely many eigenfunctions in dimension two and above that hit this bound. So, so this property is satisfied only by, by finitely many eigenfunctions of infinite, uh, infinite number. So, <clears throat> With uh, Peter Kuchman and Uzi Smilansky, we uh, uh, happened across an answer to the second question, what happens to the other eigenfunctions? So we have the following theorem, uh, and that's about 10 years old. Um, a bipartite partition uh, is a critical point. So, so we're not no longer looking at uh, minimal partitions, we are looking at critical points. Um, of this of this functional, if and only if the partition is a nodal partition corresponding to an eigenfunction. Moreover, since it's a critical point, uh, a relevant information for a critical point is its Morse index. In, in how many directions can you decrease the energy still? Uh, how many how many directions distinguish it from a minimum? Um, and it turns out that this Morse index of this critical point is equal to uh, what we call a nodal deficiency. This is uh, the number, the sort of, um, this is a measure of by how much uh, the current bound is, is, uh, is not sharp. Right? So in particular, of course, if you, uh, if you look at the previous case, uh, the Morse index of minimum is zero, and then you recover the result of Helfer, Hoffman, Ostenhoff, and Terracini. Uh, it kind of looks like their result follows from ours. It's not quite true because there are all these terms and conditions that I, I'm sweeping under the carpet, and we are assuming a lot of uh, smoothness on our partitions, and, and they do not assume smoothness. So they, they, um, they generally start from partition, prove that there is a minimizer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in spirit, it's kind of a generalization. Uh, so critical point um, corresponds to an eigenfunction. 
again, if it is bipartite. Uh, and the index is this missing number of nodal domains. Okay, um, this is motivation number one. Uh, motivation number two is uh, as follows. Um, again, we have this domain, but now we start with an eigenvalue and eigenfunction. So, so we choose an eigenvalue, lambda n, it's eigenfunction, fn, um, and denote by M fn uh, the Dirichlet to Neumann map um, constructed as follows. So it's a, it's a little bit funny Dirichlet to Neumann map. Normally you think about them as sort of Dirichlet to Neumann map on external boundary. This is on internal boundaries and it's two-sided Dirichlet to Neumann map. So um, now in blue is the nodal set of the eigenfunction. And we choose some sort of function psi on the nodal set, and then we solve the, the equation. So we solve the eigenvalue equation with the same eigenvalue, um, such that G is equal to psi on the nodal set. Now, this basically we, we solve something here and we solve for something there and they share a boundary and on the boundary, they share the value, but the derivatives no longer have to match. So there is a mismatch of normal derivatives on this boundary, on the nodal set. So this is the mismatch that we calculate. And this map psi to the mismatch of the boundary, uh, the derivatives mismatch on the boundary is, is the Dirichlet to Neumann map. We, we're given Dirichlet value and we are solving for the derivative. So um, Dirichlet to Neumann. And uh, it is a result by Graham Cox, uh, Christopher Jones, and Jeremy Merzula. Um, and also we worked on it and most recently Helfer and Sundquist worked on it. Um, that the index of this Dirichlet to Neumann map is equal to the same quantity, this nodal deficiency. How many uh, nodal domains we are missing? Which, uh, which is interesting. Uh, why is it interesting? Well, um, it looks very much like this result. I mean, it's index of some map, uh, sorry, uh, index of some cr critical point of, of, of some, some function. And it gives the same answer, but until recently, other than the fact that it gives the same answer, we, we knew of no link between the two, two things. Uh, now we know a little bit more, but that's a subject for a different talk. I think Graham, Graham Cox is uh, giving a talk about it uh, in, in about a month. Um, so let, let me repeat again. Um, let me define- Are these the, restricted to dimension two? Uh, this is not restricted to any dimension. Uh, so it can be a domain in dimension two, or it could be manifold with or without boundary. The, the tools are extremely general uh, and, and robust, so you, so you can easily generalize this. And uh, by the way, when I'm talking about index of Morse index of an operator, because this is, a, this is an operator, I, I'm thinking about the number of negative eigenvalues in the spectrum of the operator. Uh, the same way that Morse index of a point, I'm, I'm thinking about Hessian uh, being the quadratic form, so the number of negative eigenvalues in the Hessian. All right, this this was the uh, motivational sort of example, uh, motivational result from 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 uh, from the past. Number two, uh, let me tell you about result number three. <clears throat> This is now on graphs. Uh, the same result is valid on quantum graphs, but let me explain it on discrete graphs because it's just faster to, to explain. So we have a compact graphs and finite number of vertices, finite number of uh, edges. Um, and yeah, and, and one edge, uh, at most one edge between a pair of uh, vertices. And uh, we have H, the graph Laplacian, in the most generalized sense. So it's just basically some numbers uh, 
as, and we we think about uh, the the number being non-zero, meaning that there is an edge between vertex changes. Um, I am sort of assuming in below in in what I write below that uh, orthogonal entries are less than zero, uh, but you can generalize everything. It still works just just with a bit of uh, correction. Uh, on the diagonal, absolutely anything. In fact, we assume that it's a sort of generic choice of potentials on so diagonal entries, so the diagonal function doesn't vanish actually identically on, on vertices. Um, okay, and we again want to count number of zeros, uh, but I said we assume that eigenfunction is non-zero on vertices, so what are zeros? Well, uh, suppose it's negative here, negative here, positive there, positive there, positive there. We, we just imagine that it changes sign somewhere here, somewhere here, and somewhere here. And we say that we have three zeros. So, so the zeros are defined as the edges so that the eigenfunction changes sign across this, this edge. Okay. Uh, you can you can talk about nodal domains in the same vein here, but but it turns out that uh, number of zeros is the better quantity to work with. Now we introduce a magnetic field. Uh, what is magnetic field? It's a it's a map from edges uh, to real numbers. In fact, from directed edges to real to real numbers, um, and we assume it changes sign depending on the direction of the edge. And given some magnetic field, uh, uh, omega, um, we write the corresponding Laplacian. Basically, we, we just take uh, the previous one and multiply it by the corresponding phase. Uh, so that if you have zero magnetic field, you just recover the previous operator. edge. And we have the following theorem uh, with two Two different proofs uh, by myself and by Yves Calandre Verdier. That um, that omega equal to zero, so zero magnetic field, is a critical point of the eigenvalue considered as a function of of uh, essentially of the magnetic field. This is easy to prove because uh, there is symmetry. Um, I am assuming that original H is, uh, is real, so it has real entries. So, so there is this time reversal symmetry in the original operator, which leads to the symmetry in, the, um, in its dependence of the eigenvalue on the magnetic field. But, but the interesting thing is that we can calculate the Morse index of the critical point, and it turns out to be, again, related to a uh, number of zeros. So it's the number of zeros minus n minus 1. Uh, what's the meaning of n minus one? This is this baseline number of zeros according to Sturm. So again, we have some sort of excess of zero or deficit of zeros related to the Morse index. Um, in particular, I, I'm not sure why I wrote this, but I, okay, I'll, I'll try to guess. So um, in particular, you get that uh, this nodal, nodal surplus, we call it here, because, because it's, it's, it's an extra number of zeros, is between zero and beta, um, where beta is the number of cycles in the graph. So, so really, mm -hmm. there is a lot of freedom in, in choosing the magnetic field. But what is important is only the flux of the field through, through the holes. Through the holes in the graph, and there are beta holes, um, uh, so so you get immediately that this quantity is bounded by zero and beta. Um, and Lior Alon, who is uh, who is now at uh, at the institute, is uh, is doing great work uh, understanding the statistics of this quantity on graphs with. As, as beta goes to infinity. There is a conjecture that uh, there is a universal limit. It, it, it behaves like Gaussian distribution, properly rescaled. So uh, that's, that's a different advertisement of a different work. And probably you have heard about this work from Lior because he just 
cannot shut up about. Okay, so um, I'm done with my introduction. Uh, let's uh, maybe it's a good time to pose for uh, for any if, if there are any questions. Um, more questions? So I, have just, I have just a, a brief comment that this unusual Dirichlet Norman operator happened to be extremely important in the study of photonic crystals that we have done with Figotin 25 years ago. There is no relation to nodal domains, but the same operator rules there. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned briefly uh, in, in, in your uh, second result, I think, that you're assuming uh, a lot of regularity for the partition or you're assuming some regularity for the partition? Yes. Uh, is it though conceivable or, or do you have theorems like saying that if you're a critical point in some sense, then actually there is there has to be some regularity for the partition because- No, no, no. no we, we assume uh... No, we, we, we uh, no, so this is uh, a result like this is contained actually in the work of Helfer, Hoffman, Ostenhoff, and Terracini. Uh, I think Terracini is basically specializing in these variational problems, and uh, they prove that if it is a minimizer, then there is some regularity. I assume it would, it should be true as well for critical, critical um, points, not just minima. Uh, we we just uh, you just assume it. We're just but, assuming, yeah. We're assuming very generous assumptions, to be honest. Right. Um, but they're generic in the sense that uh, in two dimensions, generically eigenfunction satisfies these assumptions. We even assume that the nodal curves do not intersect, which is again generic. But but mm -hmm. like partition like this, we we don't like. They can deal with it. We cannot and would like to, but still cannot. And they, they, do, they do show that they, because of Pliel, that most of the partition, most of the minimizing partitions are not bipartite. By, by by so it means that you, you should get a lot of like uh, cusps uh, mm -hmm. that, that ruins the regularity. Yeah, it, it's, I think the understanding is that um, most partitions include this triple points. And in fact, there is a further uh, conjecture, which is uh, very beautiful that, that if you increase, if you look at high K, so a lot of, you, you break it in a lot of parts, and then you look in the middle of your domain so that you don't care, boundaries far away, you kind of zoom, then it looks like icon. Uh, so, so all partitions include this triple point. So uh, that's uh, that's a beautiful, um, very beautiful conjecture that we, you know, we we definitely far away from proving. Thanks. All right, let's. Uh, yeah, I, have, I have a question. Uh, the base eigenfunction, say the variational formula, where you're computing this uh, Morse index, but if you're at the absolute minimum, say you're looking at Laplacian on a manifold and you're looking at the base and you're twisting by these, uh, uh, by this potential that you say, then the base has a very beautiful uh, Hessian that I think Phillips uh, and I first computed in, in connection with certain problems. It's given in naturally in terms of a harmonic basis. And it's of course positive definite and it's uh, uh, relevant in many uh, asymptotic questions. So. Uh, is the Hessian got a meaning that's at the other critical points? Uh, so you, you, you said base, uh, ground yeah, state? Suppose you look, go down a bit to the last thing just before. Ground state, okay. Not, um, uh, on a manifold and you look at uh, a potential, so that, and you, as you pointed out, it's connected with the homology because it's only the, uh, what you're calling was flux. Mm -hmm. uh, you're really looking at lambda n of twisting by some uh, character of the of of, uh, of the fundamental group, mm -hmm. and you're asking how lambda n of theta, as it varies in the torus, varies, and you're computing uh, this Morse index at any eigenvalue. But I'm telling you, at the bottom eigenvalue, it's got a very mm -hmm. beautiful answer for the sec the matrix of second derivatives. I I I'm not aware of this. 
uh, so I'll, I'll send an email requesting a... Uh, yeah, so it's given beautifully... But, yeah, so if you're counting geodesics on the manifold or something like that, this enters uh, critically. This, this is very interesting because, uh, so it's, it's all work in progress, but uh, so the result I wanted to present hints that it's all these three things are the same thing. And yeah. then uh, the Hessian that appears when you calculate this Morse index is basically the same Hessian that appears there and the same Hessian that appears here. So it's the Dirichlet to Neumann map. Uh -huh. but, but I'm only saying of, at, at the base eigenvalue, do I know this? Not uh, that the higher critical, uh, so where that's an absolute minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But so uh, I, uh, we can chat afterwards. Sorry, I, I think you yeah. should get on with the lecture. Um, so thank you. This is this is very interesting, actually. Very interesting. Um, so uh, let me tell tell you now about the actual fresh results, um, which uh, I we very uh, sort of uh, pompously uh, maybe uh, uh, call lateral variation principle. At least I call it that. Uh, um, and as I mentioned, this is a joint result with Peter Kuchman uh, in the operator form, but uh, it, it came from our work with uh, Shaisa Kanzani, Graham Cox, and Jeremy Marzula, uh, where we sort of discovered it uh, studying dispersion relation of periodic graphs. Um, so the first observation is that, well, all the results above have this sort of generic form that Morse index of something is n minus number of zeros. And the number of zeros is defined differently, actually counting points or counting domains. And that contributes to this plus minus, but, but in general, this is some sort of, some sort of relationship like this holds. So is there a common root? And um, another, thoughts uh, that I'd like you to keep in mind is that uh, the first step in many proofs, for example, the Currents model bound, how is it proved? Uh, in Current Hilbert book, uh, what is the first step is as follows. You say, all right, I have an eigenfunction. It has some, some uh, curves where the eigenfunction is zero. So let me introduce Dirichlet conditions along these curves and then study the resulting problem. But the eigenfunction does not care about you introducing these extra conditions because it's already zero there. So we perturb the operator without disturbing the eigenfunction. So that's uh, kind of the, 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 the chief idea behind the construction that I'm going to detail right now. Uh, and if we run out of time, I have everything written down, but I wanted to slow down at this point so uh, you can you can follow my uh, line of thought a little bit closer. So uh, we start with some operator, self-adjoint operator S, uh, which has an eigenfunction with eigenvalue lambda naught, um, and the, the its index doesn't matter anymore. So this is sort of the base operator. And now we perturb it, uh, thinking about this, we're perturbing the operator without disturbing the eigenfunction. So we consider the following operator uh, H, uh, I'll call it K naught. We'll make this perturbation uh, where K naught is some operator that annihilates f. So then h of f will still be lambda f. So uh, the eigenfunction will still be eigenfunction of h with the same eigenvalue. Uh, to be more precise, what is going on? So uh, I already introduced the space h. I didn't say what this thing is. So it acts from h to some auxiliary Hilbert space K, they're both uh, separable Hilbert spaces and K will belong to the space of compact operators. So 
from H to K. And uh, the main properties of this K naught is that it annihilates F. So I'll define this space F naught. This is a subspace in the compact operators. Those operators that annihilate F. Uh, I also stuck in this omega in here. You can think of it as being identity. Um, but then if it is identity, then this is uh, a positive perturbation. Uh, to be more general, we want to allow non-positive perturbation. So this state is, is there to just allow the non-positive perturbation. Um, so we will assume we can do more general than this, but for simplicity, let's assume it's minus identity on some subspace and identity on some other space, but we'll need the dimension of this negative subspace to be finite. We will make some assumptions now about this lambda naught. So lambda naught, uh, we assume uh, it's below essential spectrum of the operator S and it has multiplicity. It's allowed to have multiplicity uh, because it's below essential spectrum. It must be, it cannot be have infinite multiplicity, but uh, it's allowed to have multiplicity M in the spectrum of S. But I argued that the same eigenvalue belongs to the spectrum of this uh, composite operator and we will ask that it, it is simple in this, in this spectrum. So multiplicity one in the spectrum of this operator S plus K naught star omega K naught. Uh, another thing we would like to define is the spectral shift. So, Again, just um, just imagine this this omega is identity. Forget about it. Then it's a positive perturbation. It moves this positive perturbation moves the spectrum up, but we know for sure that lambda zero remains an eigenvalue. Uh, the spectrum uh, may have moved up, and some eigenvalues may have jumped jumped above lambda naught. The number of these eigenvalues which jumped above is the spectral shift, basically. So spectral shift, and it is related to Krein's spectral shift, uh, Krein-Lipschitz spectral shift, um, but it's a much simpler case here. Everything is discrete, the spectrum is discrete. So uh, sigma is the number of the eigenvalues of uh, S smaller than lambda naught minus the number of eigenvalues of this composite, the perturbed one, also smaller than lambda naught. Because uh, I'm thinking about positive perturbation, some eigenvalues jumped out of, so this has a smaller, uh, eigen, a smaller number of eigenvalues below lambda naught. Now, what we're going to do is uh, we will start varying this operator. So this is the variation uh, in the in the name of the principle. There is lateral variation. So uh, so we think as of of this uh, of this type of perturbation as perturbation along the eigenfunction it doesn't disturb it. But now we'll switch on perturbations that go sideways from, from K naught that, that start disturbing the eigenvalue lambda naught and it will start varying. So um, this will be done by the means of uh, a function, a sufficiently smooth function from the Hilbert space K 
to the operators. Uh, so that at zero, it's equal to K naught. Uh, what do we assume about this function? We'll assume that its graph is transversal to F naught at K naught. So let me explain why uh, this is a very important uh, assumption for understanding why what I what I'm driving at, what we're we trying to do, and why this should be transversal. So now I'm I, in in this formula. I'm now allowing K not to vary arbitrarily, almost arbitrarily. But uh, I want to study the eigenvalue of this operator as a function of K now. Uh, F not describes these perturbations which don't do anything to eigenvalue. So I really don't care about those. I really want to capture everything but 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 these variations. That's why this transversality assumption. So so basically we are allowing ourselves a very general variation uh, that captures something non-trivial. Uh, so we're almost ready for the theorem. So let me define the, the main object. The main object is the eigenvalue function. Uh, so lambda is going to be the eigenvalue of this perturbed operator. K now depends on X, uh, star somewhere here, like this, uh, under the assumption that Lambda at zero is lambda naught. So we, we just track the eigenvalue as we vary the, the operator k in this formula. And the main result is as follows. Uh, first of all, x equal to zero is a critical point. So we are looking at the eigenvalue as a function of the operator. It's uh, uh, maybe a little bit difficult to get your head around it, but um, as a function of the operator, it's a critical point. So we just differentiate with respect to the operators with um, derivative is zero. And the Hessian, of lambda on uh, k has the following data. The Morse index is equal to the spectral shift. Uh, plus a little correction due to the fact that our perturbation may not be positive definite. And the nullity is m minus one. So let me remind you uh, what is what. So m was the multiplicity of the eigenvalue lambda naught in the spectrum of S. The spectral shift was the spectral shift at lambda naught uh, between the two operators, S and S plus K omega K. And this one is simply the Morse index of omega, the, the one in, in between, this, this sandwich thing. Um, so this is this is our main result. Now I'll, I'll uh, basically talk about some examples, but let me stress that there is there is a curious property, a, a curious sort of um, feature of this this result. Um, 
we are looking at the eigenvalue of this perturbed operator here, right? So, and, and then we are varying K and we are tracking the eigenvalue and we're looking at the Morse index, but S is sort of doesn't really arise in the, in the, in the data that we collect yet somehow magically it pops up here in the spectral shift. It's not quite by magic, of course, it's, uh, the, the theorem is true, um, but, but it is a little bit curious that, that it seems like S is in the background, but then suddenly it, it, plays, it comes out and plays a role in the answer. Um, all right, so let me give a couple of uh, examples and applications. First is a, a silly example uh, as follows. So I'll take my S to be zero, not just zero operator, zero number R. And uh, I'll also have here a matrix N by N Hermitian matrix and I choose its lambda N, some eigenvalue and its eigenfunction FN. And <clears throat> let me write the perturbed operator. So the perturbed operator is S plus uh, k0 star omega k0, that was the general formula. Uh, but here I choose my omega to be m n minus, uh, m minus lambda n. And I'll surround it with fn star and fn. Now, uh, what does it mean? Basically, as my Hilbert space H, I took just C1, but as my auxiliary space K, I took Cn. And then this Fn is the map from numbers into, uh, into vectors, yeah. Uh, so shouldn't it be the projection or orthogonal to Fn? Because we wanted to annihilate FN. Yeah, that's 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 a good question. Um, no, no, this is what I want. Uh, but but you you hit the nail on the head. This is why I call the example silly. I'm I'm really being silly here, and uh, I'm making something that doesn't really fit our theorem. But but stay stay with me for for a minute. Uh, you'll see what I'm sort of driving at here. Um, <clears throat> so. The, you, you completely right, this F does not annihilate uh, the, the eigenvector of, uh, of, of this guy, which is just one. Uh, but however, together, this is zero. So this whole thing is zero. So it's kind of still preserves, leaves the eigenvalue in place. There is an eigenvalue zero, which is just everything. And I made something up, but it's still zero. And let's for a moment assume that our theorem holds and um, because I violated the theorem in two places and they kind of cancel. Uh, so um, if, if the theorem holds, and I'm sure it does because the answer is good. Uh, the spectral shift here, what's the spectral shift? We had eigenvalue zero, nothing below it from the start, I perturbed it, nothing, nothing changed. The spectral shift is zero, uh, but by the theorem, the spectral shift is equal to the Morse index minus the dimension of the negative space of omega. So we conclude that the Morse index of the function f m minus lambda n f, and now f is, is, the, is, is being varied, is equal to the n minus one, the number of negative eigenvalues of this thing, which is n minus one, which is uh, of course the Rayleigh principle. As I said, the example is silly because I, I'm I'm using uh, you know fairly complicated theorem, uh, 
completely incorrectly to, to get something which is uh, pretty trivial in this setting. Um, but it's, it's kind of funny because I, I think this two, two results, really principle and what we derived is, is somehow kind of related. They, they belong on the same page. Uh, another, another application I wanted to mention, but I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail, is the reason sort of why we started this. So now uh, the uh, third result, third motivational result that I, I mentioned at the start uh, can be obtained from our theorem in, in a page or so of calculation. So, so it's now follows very easily. The other motivational results <coughs> should follow, but don't yet quite. Uh, there was a question there. All right, and let me finish uh, in the last three, four minutes uh, with a numerical example and not, not so silly anymore, but it's, it's kind of nice. It was nice for me to see <clears throat> how it all works together. So I'm, I'm taking as my matrix S uh, this matrix with, which is diagonal for simplicity uh, with eigenvalues zero, one, minus one and two. And I'll perturb it by, uh, so, so my theta is just identical, uh, sorry, my omega is just identical. And I'm perturbing it by this matrices K, K naught, uh, which is chosen so that it does not disturb the eigenvector of the eigenvalue one, which is of course one, zero, zero, zero. So, so the eigenvalue one will not be disturbed. I added this extra parameter T here because I just want to see how the eigenvalues smoothly change as, as I change T. And also I want several points for my experiments. Depending on T, I'll get different values of spectral shape. Uh, so in the picture here, uh, you see the eigenvalues of this one, this guy, as a function of T. So initially at T equal to zero, we have uh, uh, so minus two. Uh, we have eigenvalues minus two, minus one, zero, and uh, one. And then I switch on this perturbation, and this is positive definite perturbation. So all, all eigenvalues start increasing, except for eigenvalues zero, which is untouched by this perturbation. So it's staying put. And uh, if, if you, for example, look at t equal to one and you ask yourself, what's the spectral shift? Well, spectral shift is the number of crossings you got so far between here and here. So at this point, the spectral shift is two, at this point, it's uh, one, and at this point, it's zero. So it gives me three points to, to uh, sum. We also need to vary this, this matrix K. How do we vary it? Well, um, we, we add a couple of parameters, uh, x1 and x2, and we multiply them by some matrices k1 and k2. In fact, I'm taking random matrices k1 and k2. Why can I do that? Because my only condition on this variation was its transversality to something. With probability one, it's gonna be transversal. Okay, so what I'm going to plot now is I'm going to track this zero eigenvalue when I turn on this perturbation. So for small x's, what happens to the eigenvalue zero? And this is the plot, the eigenvalue zero, and this is x1 and x2. Um, and it, uh, you know, belongs to some surface, but you see it's a minimum. It's Morse index zero. Morse index coincides with the spectral shift we observed so far. At this point, again, I do the same thing. I uh, track the eigenvalue zero locally and uh, I get this picture. This is a saddle point, Morse index one. And at uh, the point 2.5, so here, spectral shift is two. You turn on the perturbation, the lateral perturbation. The <clears throat> we're moving the eigenfunction from zero somewhere else and we have a maximum. So, uh, 
I, I, I kind of, I'm always happy when I see a, a picture verifying the, the theorem. It's, uh, it's, a, it's like a second proof. So, so we see that the uh, Morse index is, is equal to the spectral shift. Um, and I think uh, I should stop now. The rest stuff here is, is not so bad. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Uh, I have to leave to teach a class, so maybe I make just very brief comment. Uh, Gregory mentioned uh, dispersion relations, which seem to be out of place here, but actually the, his magnetic theorem has equivalently can be restated without any magnetics. You have your graph, consider the maximal abelian cover of this graph and study, this is a periodic graph, and you study dispersion relation, it's theorem about structure of critical points of dispersion relation on this maximal abelian covering, right? Very good. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I ask a question, yes? Please go ahead. Yeah, so it's, um, uh, why do we need uh, this parameter space equal to K? Uh, very good question. So... Um, you don't. You don't, actually. Uh, do. Yeah, yeah, so... so it could be so, anything. So Peter, Peter is right. Uh, uh, you don't have to restrict it to K. Um, in fact, the theorem that we prove uh, is not quite this theorem, but, but uh, we allow our perturbation to, uh, to range in the whole space of the complex operators. However, if you do that, you are picking up a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff from this trivial direction, F0, which don't disturb the eigenvalue, mm -hmm. which just sort of uh, contributes to uh, contributes nothing. Um, so uh, what what we show is that uh, the Hessian on the whole space has has two parts. Uh, on this one, it's just identically zero because because just the function doesn't doesn't move, and on its complement, it actually has some meaning. And then by essentially Sylvester theorem, uh, we can conclude that it doesn't have to be orthogonal complement. Uh, it can be at any angle. So any transversal sort of plane or, or, or function will capture the, capture the behavior. Uh, but but this, this sort of, uh, however, uh, kind of, your, your question, Pavel, has two, two sides to, to me. Uh, you, you ask if, if I can rephrase the question is why, why it uh, has to be parameterized by K. What happens if it's parameterized by more than K? That's I just answered. We're picking up some trivial yes. there. Mm -hmm. And if you parameterize it by less than K, then you're not capturing all information potentially, and then it will be a, an mm -hmm. inequality rather than equality. Other questions? I have, I have another question. <laughs> Please. Okay, so, oh, so, Gregory, in the third uh, example that you had this uh, Laplacian, yes? Mm -hmm. So, what is the connection to Colline de Vertier number? Ooh, well, you better, you better ask uh, uh, Mr. Colin de Vertier. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm not sure there is a connection. Uh, because it's, it's connected with the maximum multiplicity. Right. Of uh, the second eigenvalue, if you choose this magnetic field. Yeah, but that's very restrictive. I mean, in the definition of the Colin de Verdier number of a graph, 
You allow mm -hmm. arbitrary uh, matrices which are supported there and what the biggest multiplicity, and that's a much more subtle thing. I mean, abelian covers yes. are very easy. Okay. What Can I ask a related question to this? What do you mean? I, I, I just don't know this terminology. What's the dispersion? You have lambda n block wave theory, and what is the dispersion relation? What is that quantity? Oh, oh uh, lambda is a function of, um, of the torus, the variable. quasi momenta. So yeah. basically, so, this. So what, is, so what, what do you mean by the dispersion relation? What is that? Uh, lambda is a function of quasi momenta. Yeah, and you're computing its Hessian at various points. At, I understand, at, but what's the dispersion relation? Is it just that, what, what does that mean, the word dispersion relation? Oh, oh it's just a, a, a name for this particular function. So, uh, ah, ah, okay. The, it, it's, it's just oh, a name of, of, of theta. Right, it's, it's not a relation. Uh, it's not like uh, something is related. <laughs> okay, 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 yeah. No. Then, of course, that's what it is. Yeah. Originally, originally it was the it was the, the kind of the Hessian that describe you locally around the around the crit, a critical point. It is it described the eigenvalue as a quadratic form, and when the, when physicists looks at uh, phonons, uh, and they, they look at, at, at crystals and, and and how the energy changes. And they want to, and they do like the, the second, the first and second order perturbations. So they call the coefficients, which is exactly this dispersion relation, this, the, this uh, matrix, they, they call it the dispersion relation. That's kind of the, the coefficients that makes it, makes the energy quadratic with, uh, quadratic with the, the changes. And then mm -hmm. later on, they, people try to, people started to just, Looking at the entire manifold, so the the the, the name kind of uh, was changed. Was now now it's usually referred to the entire manifold. Yeah, I, I Peter Kuchman just just left us, so he would be able to answer, I think, more fully. But I think it's it's kind of more fundamental than this. It just it's a relation. It, it gives an energy as a function of the direction of propagation of the. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. That's yeah, the origin of the Any more questions? Uh huh. So that does not seem to be the case. So thank you very much uh, for the beautiful talk. And um, oh, there's uh, something on the chat actually. Uh, no, I said um, we, we we figured it out on the chat. Um, ah, okay, okay. You already answered to that, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. So then, uh, thank you again for the nice talk, and I guess I can close the session. <laughs>